Uh, hi, I'm Paul Hanley, editor of the Church Times, and I'm uh, here with uh, Andrew Village and Leslie Francis, the two people behind the uh, coronavirus, the Church and You survey that we've been running in the, in the Church Times for the last uh, few weeks. And we've just published the first set of results, um, quite extensive results, but there are plenty more to come out um, as the survey results are being analysed by, uh, by these two. Um, uh, Leslie, tell me um, what was the purpose behind the survey? Good morning, Paul. As you will recall, this is the third time we've had the opportunity to work with the Church Times in a Church Times survey. And I really want to thank you and all your readers for the way in which those surveys have run. Andrew and I work as empirical theologians, and as empirical theologians, we take our mandate from Jesus' teaching to go and to observe the sower. When the lockdown happened, we saw the sower working in a very different kind of way, and we thought there'd be a lot to learn by going to observe. As empirical theologians, we're people who take theology seriously. Bible, doctrine, but we're also people who take seriously the methods of the social sciences. The kind of surveys we work on are designed to be able to do two things. The first is to give some headline statistics and we can deliver those quite quickly. But when we design surveys, we design them with some fairly sophisticated theory in mind that we need to dig down to develop more slowly. As time goes on, we have got the data to learn quite a lot. Imagine us as scientists looking for that vaccine, the vaccine that could help things to be different in the future. We're not there yet, but the work is progressing. What I'd like to do is to pass across to my colleague Andy, who's there with the headline information, because that's what we're most interested in today. Thank you, Leslie, and good morning, Paul. Yes, the survey's been running for uh, quite a few weeks now, and we've got nearly 7,000 replies on the main survey. We also have versions for the uh, Catholic Church and uh, in Ireland and in the UK. And so we're really excited by the response rate that we're getting. I'd, I'd like to jump, really, to... to um, Because uh, I know... I know scientists can talk about um, process yes. endlessly, um, yes. but I would like to get to some results here. Yes. Okay. Can, you, can you give us some headlines? Okay. Well, let, let's let's have a look at, um, say, start with well-being. Who was the most stressed? Um, interestingly, across the different measures we had, consistently you can see that young people, people under 50, were more stressed than old people. Um, now, it's interesting because everyone talks about the virus affecting old people, but in terms of how the process of being locked down affects people, younger people consistently come out as being feeling less close to God, feeling more stressed, feeling more frustrated. Um, and if you think about it, they're, they're the people trying to manage, perhaps still working, um, perhaps family budgets and so on. They're trying to do all those other things. Interestingly, we asked people if they were self-isolated during the lockdown and self-isolated people sometimes did better than others. So in a sense, that being cut off from all the pressures, that, that, that emerges in the data. Um, Anglo-Catholics um, consistently seem to report less uh, good scores on well-being. They seem to struggle more with this whole process than evangelicals, for example. And then if you look at, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's to do with a, a whole load of different things that we need to unpick, but it's an interesting result that's fairly consistent. Um, <clears throat> a clergy are interesting because clergy came out higher on the stress, particularly those of working age, they were stressed. And um, there's a little bit of that. We don't have enough of the hierarchy of the church, but the hierarchy, you know, bishops, archdeacons, they reported the highest levels of stress. Um, but if you look at uh, lay people, um, they, they were less stressed, but they were less happy. <laughs> um, so clergy reported better spiritual well-being, um, 
but more stress. So it's really interesting to see how, you know, you're beginning to unpick the, the differential effects of this lockdown on groups. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. All, I mean, I know that that you you struggle over the wording of the questions, but I mean, this the whole issue of stress, for example, is, mm. is a particularly difficult one to because because of course um, stress and pressure are both elements of of fulfilment as well. So the um, if you're busy, you can say you're stressed, but you're also potentially more fulfilled than somebody who's who's calmer. So uh, yes, yes. I mean, uh, one of the things we tried to do was to build in what we call balanced affect in there. And Leslie might be able to address this thing about balanced affect. Perhaps explain that a bit more. Yeah. Yes, I will. Um, one of the theories we bring in from psychology is this notion of balanced affect. We understand how people feel about things, not through one system, but two systems. People feeling negatively about things is one system. People feeling positively about things is the other system. You can't predict the one from the other. Where bad things begin to happen in people's lives is when the negative affect, the bad things, do not have the good things, positive affect, to counterbalance them. What we understand about Christian living, both for clergy and for lay people, is that there are lots of things that support positive affect. What we're not so sure of is the extent to which that positive affect building structure works in online church as it works so well in offline church. Okay. Good. Um, well, that's, that moves on really into, into mm. how the church has functioned during this um, this period, the, the receiving and giving of ministry. Tell me, a, yeah. tell me some, what you found out about that. Okay, yes. Um, so we did, what we did, we sent people down different routes depending on whether they had given or received ministry. So the people giving were not just clergy, they included lay ministers as well. So I was struck by the, the sheer range of services that people had accessed all sorts of different ways and, and lots of people had accessed several different types of service but overwhelmingly people about 80 percent or more had accessed services from their own church so i think the churches generally rose to the occasion they generally got some stuff out there we looked at um, the easter services not long after the lockdown and nearly all churches by then were at least able to give services on Good Friday and Easter Day. So on the whole, you know, we done good. Uh, we, we rose to the occasion. Um, so generally people were very positive about the online worship, but there were some variations between groups again. So one of the questions we asked was, how was the online worship compared with your normal worship? And uh, I was looking at that, some of that data, it was quite interesting. Um, so generally speaking, uh, men tended to feel that services were less, less good compared with the usual. When you look at women, they, they were more positive. Interestingly, in rural areas, um, people tended to say that the online services were better than they normally got, which is, uh, might be saying something about rural worship, but um, that's, that's a trend that's, it's not a very strong trend, but it is there. But interestingly, uh, the younger people, people under 50 were less positive about online worship. And, and you do see this emerging across several areas. You might think that younger people, oh, they're into online stuff and that's what they want. They'll take to it like a duck to water. I think there's something going on where actually some of our younger worshipers, people in their twenties and thirties, don't actually want to worship online. I think that, you know, part of the reason why they belong to the church, why they're the sort of people who fill out church time surveys, is they actually want to go to churches. And they want or, to go to buildings. Yeah. Uh, or alternatively, it could be that they have a higher standard. They may have a higher standard, yes. And, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, so they're, they're more used to doing stuff well online. And if, if they're stuck with an amateurish production, then they're not going to stick with it, are they? Yes, yeah. yeah. So, so may, I, may I come in on that one? Yeah, just yeah. Because one of the theories, again, we wanted to try to test out was the distinction between 
participation and observation. Online worship is a good opportunity to observe, but not perhaps to feel to participate. And I think what we learned from the responses was there was a much lower level of real participation than we'd have liked to have seen. Again, a question for the future. What happens when people are not participating in worship? Does it have the same consequences for life transformation? Sure. I mean, and, and, and this is a debate that's that's gone on for decades with uh, with uh, public broadcast worship, of course. So, um, uh, and and uh, the public broadcasters have, have largely withdrawn from these sorts of services because they they they're aware that they don't function um, as expected, but then um, possibly they're not putting the effort into them that, that needs to be made. Um, um, I noticed about, the, 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 there's been a lot of debate in the, in the paper, obviously, about communion. Um, what have you found out about participation in communion? Yes, I mean, obviously, for various reasons, active participation by people at home was very low. And I think that was a kind of instruction in some ways. Mm. But um, you, you might think that, say, for example, the Anglo-Catholic wing with a very high sense of the Eucharist, um, A, would, would want that ministry most, um, but also might be most anxious about um, dispersing it too easily. And, and that's more or less what you find. So Anglo-Catholics were, um, more happy with, for example, priests celebrating on their own at home without broadcasting, but um, evangelicals were more comfortable about lay people at home receiving with their own bread and wine uh, much more. So there's quite stark differences across the traditions. And I think what the lockdown did is, is expose some very different theological approaches to the Eucharist mm. that have long been there. But what, what uh, lockdown and isolation does is to ask the question, well, what do we do? Um, and theologically, what are we doing with this? So that's a really interesting um, thing to look at in more detail. So, uh, okay. Um, uh, there's, there's tons we could talk about. Um, mm. uh, um, uh, one, one, just it's an observation really, is that, is that it, most surveys I, I work with um, the results of are, are normally snap. Um, they're taken over a weekend or a couple of days mm. or something. But this is this has run for several weeks through a, a, a very shifting situation. Will you be able to, or are you able to, to determine different answers at different points of the um, the pandemic? Um, yes, we can, uh, and. Uh... Well, one of the things that one of the reasons why we need large samples is because of that, um, because we have to control for all sorts of things. I mean, one of the things that happened was we invited um, Methodists and Baptists and various other people to take part. And they did come on board a little bit. And um, so they form a higher proportion of the later responses. So we have to be careful. We're not ah, okay. getting shifts. But yes, you can if you control for some of those things. Um, I haven't done a, a lot of analysis yet, but um, it did seem to me that some of the questions we asked about how the government were handling the lockdown did seem to slightly deteriorate as things went on. And I, I think there is a growing sense in the country that maybe things weren't handled as well as we thought they were at the beginning, and that might emerge. Um, okay, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, Leslie, you, you talked about, a, um, you, you had the analogy of a, of a vaccine, therefore, um, if we're looking into the future, um, can you can you give some pointers to um, how the church might use this information? What um, what should it do better, given the huge range of experiences they've got to deal with? Yeah, <clears throat> I suppose there are four things that I'd like the church to think about. And the first is rooted in what I wanted to call a theology of individual differences. For a long time, I think the data has been showing that the Anglican Church is ministering to a, a really highly specific group of people within society. God loves a bigger group of people than that. 
what can we learn about extending the range? Inclusivity, online, offline, blended approach may include, enhance inclusivity, theology of individual differences. The second thing that I think we need to look at is what church is doing to build up both the life of Christ within its individual participants and how it is that the ministry of Christ is shared with the wider community. Sociologists talk about bonding capital and bridging capital. One of my anxieties when I set up this survey was that I was fearing that reduction of bonding capital by people not meeting together would begin to weaken the bridging capital, the capacity of church to serve community. We need to be aware of that because one of the major implications of that is the shifting of the presence of church in society, the shifting from being church with a local presence into being a sect with a gathered presence, online gathered or offline gathered, an enormous ecclesiological issue in that as well. And the fourth thing we've already hinted at is to do with what church and the Christian faith is doing to enhance the well-being, both of individuals and of society. Again, the bringing of people together in place may have psychological impact to enhance the benefit of positive affect that counterbalances those things that we can't take away. The new normal that we're going to get is a normal in which I think we all anticipate we're going to have to live with the uncertainty of that virus being around. The building up of positive psychological capital could be very important to counterbalance that. And there's a great deal within the gospel that enables that to be done, but it will be done differently in online and offline presences. Tiresome thing, scientists, they need to get into their data to understand what's going on with that data before they can really predict. I really hope we don't get another lockdown, but if we do, then I think the time is to look again with a similar kind of survey and to see how things are going to be in that situation compared with how they are in this. Time trends are important. Let's pray we don't get that lockdown. But if we do, let's also pray that we may got, have those resources to observe the seller, as well as to see the way in which the seller is behaving. Thank you, Leslie, and, and thank you both. That's, I mean, it's, um, I mean, I hope we will um, be able to to cover some more of the things that, as you pull things out of this, it's, um, mm. I mean, it is, it's fascinating and important that that um, it's an opportunity. It seems to me for the church to to move on an empirical um basis rather than an inspirational one which can sometimes not be as as well focused <laughs> um, that's what we stand for yes absolutely excellent thank you so much okay thank you thank you